our role regarding divisive people. The Bible doesn't tell us to fix them. It says, warn them, avoid them, and if those things don't work, you distance yourself from them. But it doesn't tell us to fix them. God has to fix some people that we can't. So pray for them. Don't try to fix them because a house divided against itself will not stand. Romans chapter 16. Uh, in the closing chapter of Romans, this is the closing chapter of Romans, Paul gives a special farewell greeting and commendation to 29 people that he mentions by name. 10 of those 29 are women. And here in chapter 16, he opens by mentioning one of those 10 women. In chapter 16, verse 1 and verse 2, he commends a woman by the name of Phoebe. She is from the church in Centria. Centria was a port city near the ancient city of Corinth, which is in modern Greece. And Paul mentions her, and he, in fact, he says in verse 2, he says to the church at Rome, receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, because most scholars believe that Phoebe is the one who hand-delivered this letter to the church of Rome that Paul had written. Now, check this out. She's from the church in Centria. That is about 750 miles from Rome, Italy. So she makes this journey here to hand deliver this letter that we've been reading here over the last several months, the letter to the church at Rome. So that's why Paul mentions her by name, commends her to that fellowship. And after he gives these greetings and commendations to 29 people by name in this closing chapter, he concludes his letter here with one final exhortation. And I always find that interesting. It's like, you know, when you or I might write a letter, if you're still old school, you might actually write a handwritten letter, and, and, you, and you say some of the most important things near the end, just to kind of emphasize what's most on your heart. And I want you to notice the thing that Paul hones in on here as the thing that he stresses more than anything else. It's in verse 17. So here in Romans 16, I'm going to read verse 17 down through verse 20. He says, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Now, in contrast, look at the next verse, verse 19. For your obedience has become known to all. Don't you love that? The, their reputation as a church was, you've been obedient, you've been faithful. But he says, I got to warn you about people who can be divisive. And he adds there in the rest of verse 19, therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, amen. Now that last verse, by the way, is gonna be the topic of next Sunday's study. I'm gonna talk about spiritual warfare. May the God of peace crush Satan under your feet. That's next week's Bible study. But for today, we're gonna to talk here about the warning of divisiveness. The warning about divisiveness. I've entitled today's teaching, A House Divided. Let's pray first. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word and for this final exhortation that Paul gives to the church in Rome and by extension to us today. We pray, God, that you would help us to hear and receive what your spirit would say to us in our day. And we give you the praise and the glory for your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. You know, what's interesting, when you look at the Bible, it's, it's interesting to note that God likes most forms of math operations. What do I mean? Well, God is into addition, clearly, because, for example, Acts 2.47 says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. We also know that God is into multiplication, because in Acts 6, verse 7, it says, then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. We even see in the Bible that sometimes when necessary, God practices subtraction. 
There's another story in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 5, when this guy named Ananias and his wife Sapphira show up, and they tell the early apostles that they gave a certain sum of money to the Lord, and they lied about it. They didn't actually give what they say that they gave, and so God decided to just kill them. Yeah, God took them out. He practiced blessed subtraction, okay, <laughs> when necessary. So God likes addition, multiplication. He even sometimes practices subtraction. But the one operation he does not like and will not tolerate in the church especially, but anywhere generally, is division. Division. Now the one exception would be in regards to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 when he talked about how he came to, be, to bring division in this sense. When you have a household where there are some who are believers in Jesus and others who are not, there will be natural division in that household because some believe in Jesus and some do not. But otherwise, the kind of division that God hates is the division that is caused by things like envy, jealousy, pride, selfish ambition. That kind of division God does not tolerate. And this is the kind of evil division that Paul is referring to here in Romans chapter 16. His last word of instruction and exhortation to this church is, you better be watching out for people who cause division. And he says, I want you to note them, call them out, and avoid them. That's how serious this is. Of all the things that Paul could have emphasized in his closing statement to this church, he emphasizes this. He says, I want you to be on your guard against people who cause division. Now, I want to be faithful to the text as a pastor, so I want to just make sure we understand that the context of the text, when he speaks here about division, he's speaking specifically about people who cause division by teaching doctrines that are inconsistent with Scripture. Because he specifically says, glance again at your Bibles there, verse 17, he talks about those who cause division because what they're saying is contrary to the doctrine which you learned. So that's the context of the text. People who cause division in the church because they're teaching things that are inconsistent with Scripture itself. And he says, you better note them and you better avoid them. But I'm going to actually use that term, division or divisiveness, as kind of a springboard. I'm going to use this text as a springboard to talk more broadly about divisiveness. Because you can have divisiveness not just in a church. You can have it in a family, you can have it in a business, you can have it in any organization where there are people, there's the potential for there to be division. And it is important for us to understand because divisive people can destroy whatever they belong to. And if, if you're not on your guard about it, it will destroy what, whatever you're a part of. Divisive people don't care what they destroy. The reason they don't care what they destroy is because they don't care about the larger group that they belong to. They only care about themselves. They are driven by selfish ambition, by personal interests. This is what Paul means here in verse 18 when he talks about divisive people. He says in verse 18, for those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. What does he mean by that? The belly is just a term for personal appetites. They just have selfish interests. They have a personal appetite. Their ambition is to do whatever benefits self. They don't really care about the larger group of people. That's the nature of divisive people. Now, what makes for a divisive person? Well, we can look in the Bible and we can see a couple of examples of divisive people. One person that comes to mind is all the way back in the book of Numbers. You don't need to turn there. It's chapter 16. It's a guy by the name of Korah. Korah was a guy who was opposed to Moses' leadership. This is during the time period when Moses was the prophet of God, appointed by God to lead the Hebrew people after 400 years of slavery in Egypt on their way to the promised land. And somewhere in the middle, Korah, and Korah recruits a few of his homeboys, Dathan and Abiram, and those three guys are like, we don't like Moses. We don't like his leadership. It's taken too long to get where we're trying to head to. And so Korah leads this divisive rebellion. It's like a coup against Moses. And, and Korah basically says, Moses, who made you leader? And Moses is like, uh, kind of God did. <laughs> kind of God did. And Korah's like, well, you know what? 
we could do as good a job as you're doing. We don't think you're doing a very good job. You're an old man now. I mean, Moses was 80 in this final season of his life here. And he's like, you know, you're an old guy now. And so it's time for you to just sit down, old man. Let somebody else come in and take over. Because, you know, remember, imagine what can be unburdened by what has been. I'm sorry. I, I got... I got some stories mixed up in my head. I'm sorry. So anyway, back here in our story, in this story here, so comma, I mean, Korah, uh, Korah led a coup against an old man. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Korah led a coup against an old man and said, we're taking over. You just sit down. You be quiet. And we're in charge now. Okay. Now. When this is going down, God is overhearing all this. So in number 16, in verse 26, God says to Moses, Moses, step aside from the tents of these divisive people. I'm about to smoke them. All right? (laughs) And what God did was he called those people together who were leading this coup against Moses. And the Bible says, and he opened up the earth and they all went in and he closed the earth back up. And God's like, now we can get on with business. All right? Korah was divisive, and he was leading a division, and God hates division. I'll give you another example in the Bible. It's out of 2 Samuel chapter 15. This guy's name is Absalom. He's one of King David's sons. But Absalom thought he could do a better job as king. So Absalom positions himself at the entrance of the city gate of Jerusalem. As people were coming by, he's kissing babies, he's shaking hands. He's the premier politician standing out there ingratiating himself with all the people. As they'd come by, he would be like, I feel your pain. I do. I feel your pain. I can empathize with you. If I were king, I'd do a much better job. Make me king. All right? And so that was, I'm getting other stories mixed up in my head today. But anyway, that was Absalom. Absalom was like, I'd be a better king. Don't listen to my dad. If I were king, I'd do this differently. I'd do that differently. And he's he's really trying to be very empathetic with the people. Okay, He, he raises up a rebellion. He causes division. And it says in 2 Samuel 15, verse 6, that he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. And he came to a very tragic end because God hates division. And so Joab... David's general took 10 of his elite fighting men and they hunted Absalom down and they killed him. God hates division. Now, why does God hate division? The answer is because division is contrary to the nature of God and the source of all division, hear me on this, is Satan. The source of all division is Satan and it is contrary to God's nature to be divisive. Listen how much God hates division. And dare I say, and this might sound uncharitable, and you're going to be like, this doesn't sound like you should even say such a thing in church. The Bible actually says he hates divisive people. He doesn't it just hate the action of div- divisiveness. He actually, it says in Proverbs 6, I'm going to read it to you, he hates divisive people. This is Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. Listen. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and number seven, are you ready? And one who sows discord among brethren. One who sows discord among brethren is listed among the things that God hates. He hates division because Satan is behind all division. He's the very first divisive being in the universe, Satan was. And he still incites people today to follow his example. Satan was originally created as a marvelous, majestic angel. Scholars say he was probably in charge of all the angelic beings in heaven. His original name was Lucifer. It comes from words that that mean light bearer. The Bible describes in Isaiah and Ezekiel the beauty of his created body, this angelic creature serving God. But one day it says pride entered his heart and he decided he could ascend to the throne of God. He decided he was as good as God, if not even better. 
And he led a rebellion in heaven. A third of the angels went with him. And God judged and expelled him from heaven where he was sent to earth, still allowed for a time, even presently, to roam this earth, to steal, kill, and destroy. And when Satan was expelled to earth, what's the first thing he did? He sows seeds of division and discord with the first family. He divides Eve from Adam. He divides Adam from God. He does everything he can to divide what is combined. You see, listen, sin entered the human race at this point. Now check out, that was the first thing Satan did when he was expelled to earth. He brought division. What's the first thing God does when sin entered the human race? He implemented a plan of reconciliation because God is about reconciliation and Satan is about division. God is about taking what is broken and bringing it together. Satan is about taking what is together and breaking it. That has to do with your marriage. That has to do with your kids, your family. That has to do with the church. That has to do with our nation. Look at all the division in our nation right now. Who's behind that? It's Satan. Satan wants to divide people in, in every aspect. Satan wants to divide people racially. He wants to divide people economically. He, he wants to divide people socially. He wants to divide people over every way he can. Remember, God is the great uniter. Satan is the great divider. Wherever you see division, note that it's Satan behind that division. And so this is why God hates it. It doesn't represent his own character. He's a reconciler. He is a uniter. He takes broken things and brings them together, whereas Satan, on the other hand, takes things that are together and he breaks them, which means this, and this is the hard truth, but I'm going to say it, that if you are a divisive person, you are not operating in the spirit of Jesus. You are operating in the spirit of Satan. Divisiveness is Satan's game. And if he can't personally do his good work in some situation, he will recruit people to do his bidding. And we have to be aware of this. It's easy for us to get caught up in divisive things, unaware. But we must be on our guard about this kind of thing. Over my 33 years here at Cornerstone, it's the one issue that I have felt strongly compelled to be on guard against, whether in the church or on our staff. And I am thankful to God that he has honored my prayers over these years because I have prayed. I've said, Lord, take divisive people out. And if you want to tell me and I have to show them the door, I want to be obedient to that. And I've had to fire a couple of people on our staff because of divisiveness. Why? Because Jesus says in Matthew 12, 25, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. In Titus 3, 10 to 11, it says, warn a divisive person once, then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. So God calls us to be on guard against this kind of thing, to look at our own hearts and then to be careful about any divisiveness that we are associated with. Now listen, and, and let me stress this. Just because someone might have a different perspective on something, a different opinion, a different idea, does not a divisive person necessarily make them, okay? We are benefited by different ideas, different perspectives, different viewpoints. None of us has the angle to everything. So it is good to have coworkers and friends and family members who can also say things that are at a different perspective, a different angle, a different viewpoint. Those things are welcomed. Those things are necessary to help us be rounded individuals. I'm not talking about that. We need different people in our lives. So then the question becomes, what defines and how can you discern a divisive person versus just someone who's different with different ideas and different opinions. I'm going to give you four quick things. Number one, how do you know divisive people? Number one, by their spirit. By their spirit. What's the spirit behind their attitude or actions? You need to ask yourself, like, are they genuinely contributing to the overall good of the organization, meaning either the family or the business or the church? Or do they have selfish motives? 
Divisive people are self-seeking instead of others-oriented. I'm going to say that again. Divisive people are self-seeking instead of others-oriented. There literally is a Luciferian spirit behind divisive people where they often think that they know better and they can do it better and they often see themselves on a mission to correct what in their mind is wrong and they're not team players, they are solo manipulators. You got to discern their spirit. And here's one way how you can really tell if someone is simply different and contributing ideas or contributing a different perspective versus someone who has a divisive spirit. Tell them no and watch how they react. A person who's just different with a different idea, they might at first be like, oh, you, you, don't, you don't like what I had to say, okay. But they'll take it in stride and they'll realize like, okay, not today, not this idea, not this thought, whatever. But someone who has a divisive spirit will always be offended because they'll take it personally because it's not about the larger group, it's about themselves. And if they're told no, then they react in a way that shows they're upset and they're angry. James 3.16 says, For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Number two, you can spot a divisive uh, people by their words. Do they say things to your face or do they say to others what they won't say to you? Divisive people would rather talk about you than to you. Proverbs 16, 28 says, a perverse man stirs up dissension and a gossip separates close friends. You ever, talking about words and, you know, division, you ever experienced in your family, okay, now listen, when I, before I even ask the question, every family this side of the Garden of Eden is dysfunctional, okay? So I'm not, I'm not saying your family's worse than the next family. We all have our issues, every single family. But have you ever experienced in your family a triangle of communication? What do I mean? Okay, I'm talking about adults, all right? Sister number one talks to sister number two. Sister number two talks to sister number three, but sister number three does not talk to sister number one. Sister number three will talk to sister number two about sister number one. Sister number one will talk to sister number two about sister number three, but sister number three and sister number one do not talk. That's a triangle, and that's division. Because then you're always, especially if you're sister number two, because you're feeling like, I got I to gotta keep sister number one happy and sister number three happy. And so I got to talk to her. I got to talk to her. These two don't talk. I got to be a peacemaker. How am I supposed to? You, you get into that triangular mess. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you how you get out of that triangle. You say to all the sisters, I'm not a part of this anymore. You all can talk, but I am not going to talk about you all behind your backs. I'm going to talk to your face, and you can talk to each other's face, but none of this triangular stuff. That is so unhealthy. That is so divisive. So just stop playing the game. Do your part. Look, you're not responsible for the rest of the sisters, okay, or the brothers, whatever the case might be. But you are responsible for yourself. Are you going to keep engage, engaging in this triangular kind of divisiveness? Or are you going to be able to say, you know what, I'm not playing this game anymore. You guys can talk to each other, but I refuse to talk about you or around you or to each other about the other person. Just stop playing the game. It'll stop. Divisiveness is something that we can play a role in or not. It's important because our words can tell if we're a divisive person. Number three, their attitude. Divisive people are not teachable or humble. They have a self-righteous attitude, and they often don't respect authority. And Jude refers to divisive people. Jude only had one chapter, but in verse 19, Jude calls divisive people worldly people devoid of the Spirit. They are worldly people. They are devoid of the Spirit. Notice their attitude. If they're not humble and teachable, if they're proud and arrogant, self-righteous people, that is a, an indication that somebody potentially is a divisive individual. And finally, number four, you can also tell divisive people by their actions, because divisive people do divisive things. They cause conflict and disrupt the harmony and unity of a family, a church, or an organization. They intentionally disrupt that kind of harmony and unity by their actions, by things that they do. Solomon 
had some advice about a person like this when he wrote Proverbs 22, verse 10. He said, drive out the mocker and out goes strife. Quarrels and insults are ended. Now, let me just say this in, in wrapping this up. I know it, it kind of got quiet in, in the room today. I get it. Because, you know, you either might be a little convicted, perhaps, or you know some people in your life that you would consider to be divisive. And it's been hard on you, maybe a family member, maybe in your business, whatever the case may be. What is interesting to me is when I was doing my homework and research and all this and, and cross-referencing Scripture with Scripture, the Bible makes it clear about our role regarding divisive people. That is to say, it exhorts us to warn divisive people. I just read verses to you. It warns us, it tells us to avoid divisive people. I read that verse to you. It even tells us, as I just read Proverbs 22.10, to sometimes drive them out. It does not tell us to fix them. And that means that we have to give divisive people to the Lord. We have to first check our own hearts to make sure we don't fall into that camp. But then if there are divisive people in, in our circles, the Bible doesn't tell us to fix them. It says, warn them, avoid them, and if those things don't work, you distance yourself from them. But it doesn't tell us to fix them. God has to fix some people that we can't. So pray for them. Don't try to fix them. Warn them, avoid them, and if necessary, distance yourself from them. Don't try to fix them. That's God's part. But why is this so serious? Because a house divided against itself will not stand. May God, as the one who unifies and reconciles, guard our hearts, our lives, our families, our church. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, this is our prayer. This is a strong exhortation Paul ends this letter with. We pray, Lord, against any spirit of divisiveness in our own church. Thank you, Lord, for watching over us these 30 plus years. I think of families right now that are suffering because there's some divisive element in their own home. I think of somebody who's running a business and there's some divisive people undermining the organization. Lord, wherever there are people, there's the potential for there to be division. And we know the spirit of divisiveness is Satan himself. So I pray in Jesus' name that you would help those families, those businesses, those churches, those organizations, wherever there's division, Lord, drive out divisive people. Or else, Lord, do your good work to bring them to a place of surrender so they would no longer be a part of divisiveness, but they would be contrite, humble, teachable. Because, Lord, you are about reconciliation. Satan is about division. And so do a good reconciling work in families, churches, organizations where needed, Lord. We look to you, the great reconciler and unifier, and pray in Jesus' name for you to do your good work where needed. Because a house divided against itself will not stand. Thank you for your word today, Lord. Guard our own hearts against being divisive. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen.